Good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to you all. I'm Alexa Clay. I'm an economic historian, co-author of The Misfit Economy, and director of the RSA here in the U.S., and I'm delighted to be here for this very special RSA event with the brilliant economic analyst and commentator, Rana Furar. Rana has a very lengthy list of credentials and awards, but I'll try to keep the list brief so we can make the most of our time together. She's an associate editor and global business columnist at the FT and global economic analyst at CNN. Having published two prize-winning books on finance and big tech respectively, Rana's third book, Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World, has been garnering rave reviews from some of the world's greatest economists and journalists. Rana, thanks so much for joining us here today. Would you be able to kick us off giving us a bit of insight into the big idea at the heart of homecoming? Well, thank you. Thank you, Alexa. Thanks to the RSA um, and thanks to everyone listening uh, to this program. You know, I'm often asked to summarize my book in a line. And if I had to do that, I would say the world is not flat. <laughs> and that's basically a reference, not just to geography, but uh, to, to the Thomas Friedman book, The World is Flat, which came out in 2005, and that period in which that book was written, um, the period from 2003 to 2007, was the fastest global growth on history. And I would say that it was the apex of a certain kind of what I would call neoliberal globalization. And when I use the term neoliberal, which is used you know, in different ways on either side of the Atlantic sometimes, I'm really sort of looking at it the way the IMF does, as an economic theory that posits that capital, goods, and people can all travel equally uh, and quickly and productively and will land where it's you know sort of best for them to do so at a global level. Now, this philosophy, which has really been the way globalization has operated for the last half century or so, created more wealth at a global level than ever before. But it also created tremendous in-country inequality, not just in the US, but really in, in many nations, in most nations, uh, in the OECD at least. And I think that there, there was a reason for that, which is that there's a chink in the theory, and that's that capital always moves faster than either goods or people, right? And so that creates uh, a market system, a global market system that is increasingly disconnected from national politics. And that has led to, I think, a number of really important uh, trends in the world. Economically, you have um, a financial system that is, depending on the size of the market in any given day, between two and four times the size of the real economy, um, which is, I think, very distorting. That was that financialization was the topic of my first book. But it also, and this is something I explore more in, in Homecoming, it also creates, um, I think, a sense of disconnection between citizens and the market economy, citizens living in the nation state, which is still where most politics take place. And that has led, I believe, to um, things like Brexit, uh, the rise of Donald Trump, also in some ways the rise of Bernie Sanders, you know, far right, far left politics, um, because the votership in many countries feels now that there is a system that is being run that is is just way up in the clouds ahead of where they actually live and certainly not connected to their felt experience. And with that, maybe I'll share just one kind of telling reporting example from the book. We often talk about economics in very theoretical terms, very dry terms, but really economics is about people. And um, one of the really profound conversations I have that led me to write this book was with the former labor leader, um, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, Richard Trumka, who used to be the head of the AFL-CIO, which is the largest union in America. And I went down to see him in Washington as I was reporting this book. And I, and I spoke to him, I said, tell me the conversations that you were having in the 90s, in the run up to things like the NAFTA trade deal, the accession of China into the WTO, which happened in 2001. What were you being told about how this was gonna impact labor in the US. And he said that a policymaker from the Clinton administration had come to him and said, look, we know that this is going to hurt you all in the short term, but don't worry, there's going to be a leveling out or a leveling up, the term is often used, of wages globally. And everybody's going to end up on an equal playing field. The world is flat. You know, all boats are going to rise. And Trumpka said, well, okay, but how long is this going to take? And the policymaker said, three to five generations. And that to me, I mean, it just stopped my heart because it said so much, A, about frankly, the hubris of economics, the idea that you can model 
a very complicated world over three to five generations and that things are going to turn out fine and you're not going to get feedback loops of policy decisions that could be problematic, like the China shock in the US, um, you know, and even the perception uh, that globalization is not always benefiting national interest. And we can, you know, we can tease that out more, but that political perception is powerful. So, um, so that's where we are, I think. And I'll just say a, a couple more things. I actually thought that the turning point was going to be the 2008 crisis. But I think what happened is we didn't, A, we didn't get the right narrative. We got a very technocratic narrative. It was all about banks and tier one capital and things that were sort of, you know, we write about in the Financial Times, but real people don't care that much about. But I think that the pandemic was truly like a scrim that was pulled up on some of the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities in the old system. So suddenly, you know, you you get this pandemic and you can't find what you need on grocery shelves and you can't find PPE and people are talking about supply chains. You know, the, the president of the United States is talking about supply chains in the State of the Union address, which is kind of incredible. This wonky topic is now front and center. And we begin to see that the neoliberal system, in addition to sort of pulling apart the global market system and national interest has actually led to a tremendous concentration of power. So you see, and, and there's been some wonderful research actually that I cite in my book from, from the UN Trade um, uh, and Development Council, uh, looking at who has really benefited most as a single entity from the last 50 years. And it's essentially multinational companies, a handful of them in the US in particular, and China, and you know nothing against China, but basically the bargain of the last 50 years was cheap capital from the US and the West going to cheap labor uh, in places like Asia, namely China. Um, cheap energy was a part of this, but all those things are going away now. Cheap capital, we're entering a new era of monetary policy. Rates are not gonna be trending down the way they have the last four decades. Cheap labor is over, and this is a point I want to draw out quickly because we often think about the post neoliberal world as being something that was put on steroids by the Trump administration and the tariffs and the trade war. Um, that's part of the story, but if you go back, even before Donald Trump was in office, China came out with its Made in China 2025 program, which said, hey, we're a wealthier nation now. We want to consume and produce locally. We want to do more regionally. We want to own more of our own supply chains. And whatever you think of Xi Jinping's regime, and I'm, I've been a bit hawkish about that, I think that's a good thing. It makes sense for reasons of um, uh, moving up the economic ladder, to reduce emissions, to reduce energy costs. Um, so that cheap labor paradigm from Asia is going away. And we're moving to a world of more regionalization and a focus on resiliency. Europeans in particular realize, hey, it's not okay to get your gas from an autocrat. Americans are realizing, hey, it's not okay to have uh, just a handful of large companies uh, monopolizing the food supply. And so um, there are a lot of tailwinds to this trend, some of them worrisome, uh, fractious geopolitics, some of them good, um, you know, concerns about climate, concerns about real labor standards. We're realizing that cheap isn't really cheap the way we thought it was. And I think we're really at the pivot point of a new world. So maybe I'll I'll stop with that and we can launch into questions. Thank you so much. I think, you know, you just articulate something that is so, you know, right to this moment. Um, and it really feels like it's captured the imagination now. And and agree with you, in 2008, a lot of people were calling into question, you know, mainstream economic doctrine, but it didn't feel like we had uh, enough of imagine, imagination, frankly, to think about other potential pathways. And so one thing you really talk about is that focus on resilience. And I think mm -hmm. someone could read your book and have almost this nostalgic moment for even industrialists of the past, right, who really cared about place, thinking about people like Hershey or Rockefeller, or just, you know, these entrepreneurs that were really localized. Um, and one thing you make the the distinction with is it's about resilience it's not about protectionism right and right. so i could you just situate kind of this this emerging philosophy that you have so that it doesn't feel regressive because i think there's a temptation mm -hmm. in reading this to go back to a more nationalistic economy a more protectionistic economy and actually you know the through line for you is around resilience which which is a response in part to this poly crisis that we're now in yeah, I love the framing of that question. So two thoughts come to mind. One, uh, uh, first of all, I take your point there. there, And, you know, to be honest, to be fair, there is a little bit of nostalgia because, you know, I grew up in the rural Midwest and 
I really lived um, the sharp end of the policies of the 80s and the 90s and the noughties. And so I saw what my community was before, a vibrant community, lots of small businesses, a mix of production and consumption. And I saw what it became as industry became much more consolidated, um, uh, as jobs were were sent abroad or done, done by technology without the training and the education to lift up workers so that they could be part of that change. Um, so, so in that sense, there is some nostalgia, but two points come to mind. One, industrial strategy, a little bit more thinking about what kind of economy we want to live in rather than just a loss, totally laissez-faire approach is actually a deep part of American history. You can go back to the Hamiltonian approach to industrial strategy. I mean, Hamilton was all about, hey, what kind of economy should America be? What kind of society should it be? And let's let's um, you know make some tweaks and some incentives to push things in that direction. And to be honest, China, to its great credit, took a lot out of that Hamiltonian playbook and America's own industrial policy playbook, which it kind of started to get rid of, um, certainly in the Reagan Thatcher era, you know, possibly even before. Um, so that's point number one. But point number two is this is really about power. It's not anti-China, it's not isolationist, it's about looking at power. And that's something that we lost in the Milton Friedman era. You know, we started to look in, uh, certainly in, in the Anglo-American world and increasingly elsewhere as those ideas were disseminated at a very narrow, very mathematical um, sort of construct of well-being. As long as share prices were going up and consumer prices were going down, hey, everything's fine, there's no problem. But as we all know, as anybody who's not an economist knows, that's not always how the real world works. Markets aren't perfectly efficient. One of my great um, mentors and sort of intellectual rabbis, Joe Stiglitz, who came up, you know, he won the Nobel for, for basically pointing out that markets aren't always efficient on their own. And they sometimes need to be nudged by, um, by uh, the public sector or other stakeholders. I asked him, I said, how did you come up with that insight in the 60s? I mean, this was really way before the Re Reagan Thatcher revolution. And he said, well, I grew up in Gary, Indiana. All I had to do was walk out of my door to see that markets weren't always efficient. Um, so what I'm saying is power exists, stakeholders exist. What we think of as free markets are free for multinational companies, but they're not always free for labor in many countries. And we need to address power issues. And so I look at concentration of power, be it in companies um, like large, um, you know, U.S. multinationals in particular, but in countries like China, a state-run capitalist society that has a lot of controls, and there are many, many such economies, but China being the largest, a lot of controls on the way market markets work. And I say, okay, looking at these structures, can we assume that this entirely laissez-faire Chicago school theory can hold and that we can that the world is flat that that um, you know all players have have an equal playing field i don't think so and you know that kind of goes back to adam smith 101 i mean you know smith would have said okay what are the things you need for a properly functioning market equal access to information a shared understanding of what the transaction is and a shared moral framework and really it's hard for me to think of too many uh types of market interactions today that have those three factors yeah, I love how as as you articulate how we need to disentangle ourselves from this neoliberal order, you're saying how shocked, you know, Adam Smith would be at the current state of the ways in which a lot of his liberal economic ideas have been, you know, politicized towards these ends. At the RSA, we talk a lot about quality growth. Um, it's, it's the quality of the growth that matters. So it's not just GDP and having more interesting stories to tell about growth in terms of that quality from an equity, from an opportunity perspective. And, you know, one of the concrete strategies is looking at um, sort of divorcing ourselves from shareholder value as the only indicator of success. Have you seen that be successful, a focus on more stakeholder capitalism? I know it's kind of being talked about as a narrative, but to what extent is that transition possible? Does that mean more implications for, for public ownership? Mm. Well, so yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This sort of post neoliberal world dialogue is interacting with the move from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. That's, as you well know, a big, messy sort of pond <laughs> of of ideas that is still um, really sort of swirling around and developing. A couple of thoughts. 
Certainly, we are seeing even market participants say, gosh, share, shareholder value is, is too limited a metric. Um, certainly, for countries that are competing in a world with state-run societies in which they're looking at the 10 years, the 20 years, the 50 years, quarterly capitalism doesn't work. Now, the question is, what's the metric? Of, stake, of, of shareholder capitalism. And that's where things get tricky. Um, I remember actually when Larry Fink, um, you know, the largest asset manager in the world, kind of said, um, hey, you know, we're, we're done with shareholder value. We want to move to stakeholder value. And all the CEOs were like, okay, but tell us what we should be measuring. Well, I think the climate transition and actually war in Ukraine have presented a real opportunity here because we have all realized globally that we need to make the transition to clean energy to an, a, a carbon neutral world much more quickly for frankly reasons of national security um, and you know and growth as you say we we need to move to more sustainable equitable growth I think that that is going to be um, the narrative of the next 50 years it's not going to be just about GDP it's going to be what's inclusive and what's green because the big big issues right now are sustainability and how do we redistribute wealth in such a way that we don't have political polarization and you know revolutions and you know and fight wars now how is this being turned into real world change well one thing i've been tracking very closely in the us is the inflation reduction act and the inflation reduction act which is very cleverly named by politicians um is actually a climate bill right it's it's meant to create some carrots and sticks to allow companies both in the US, but increasingly amongst um, other free trade partners and, and you know really any country that's doing the right thing by the environment to take part in this green transition that's being subsidized in the US, which is the largest consumer market still in the world. And in the creation of those carrots and sticks and in the tracking of supply chains, we are beginning to get this incredible window into corporate behavior over the last half century. And so you begin to see, gosh, let's see how that $5 t-shirt was made. Was it made with child labor? Was it made in a place that um, the environmental standards are nil uh, and the land is being degraded? Conversely, let's look at um, the production in, in a European country or, you know, I'm sitting right now in the Carolinas and there's a big textile industry here and it tends to be family owned, very well run, very clean, you know, a lot of kind of zero um, uh, re you know, recycling, sort of a circular economy, a lot of recycling of waste and, um, you know, cotton seeds are given to farmers nearby, um, you know, for feed. So that when that starts to get rewarded, then you start to really see a shift in the incentives for the market and companies and market participants actually start to be rewarded for growing in a different way, which is, I think, what you were getting at by saying, you know, we need to focus on inclusivity and sustainability. Are folks doing the right thing by the planet and by labor? Now, I don't want to be too Panglossian. Um, the U.S. is in the middle of some major Asian trade negotiations right now. And that's going to be another place where the rubber hits the road because, you know, we need to build a new block of trade partners to present an alternative to China's one belt, one road system. But some of those trade partners are countries that really don't have great environmental and labor standards. And so are we going to really walk the walk this time? And if we don't, that's going to be very, very bad, not just for the economy, but for democracy, because if we start to see a degradation of white collar jobs, um, jobs in data, you know, jobs in um, around outsourcing of technologies the same way that we did in the manufacturing sector. Boy, we're going to be in a bad place politically in the next few years. Fantastic. And two of the case studies I really appreciated that you you fleshed out in a lot of detail, one around um, agriculture and looking at our global food systems, which have really been globalized. And, and I was just for the last two weeks in the Central Valley, which is, you know, the kind of hub of agriculture in the U.S. Yeah. and talking to farmers about the price of almonds and water and, and you know, all these <laughs> kind of cluster 
um, of, of different issues there. And then another instance that you bring up is just housing and how much that's been really controlled by, you know, the pressures of financialization. My aunt who lives in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina gets knocks on her door from, you know, private equity company salesmen who want to buy her house. Can you, can you trace a little bit how, how the globalization story has affected those two kind of primary goods and then what it, what it would mean to transition kind of off of that neoliberal agenda in those sectors? Mm, what a great question. Um, let me start with agriculture. And I'm so pleased that you've gotten a chance to see the Central Valley because that is just a fascinating case, underexplored case study. Um, so the Central Valley uh, is one of about three global growing regions where a lot of uh, food production of fruits and vegetables, sort of healthy foods, not cash crops like corn and soybeans, that's in the middle of the country, but um, the foods we really need um, from a dietary standpoint get produced in California. Um, so it's a fascinating place to look at this story. And as part of the book, I actually kind of traveled from the beltway through the middle of the country into California to look at food systems and see what's gone wrong. And the window for me or the starting point for me was, okay, COVID hits, suddenly all the restaurants are closed in the country, but the grocery stores are, you know, you're seeing a shortfall of, of, of inventory. You see people lined up outside. Meanwhile, farmers are dumping milk and meat. Let's go back to efficient market theory. That shouldn't happen. That, that weird supply and demand mismatch shouldn't exist. So why does it exist? Well, in the case of the U.S., there are two entirely separate, highly siloed, highly concentrated food supply chains. One goes to restaurants, one goes to um, uh, grocery stores and, and caterers and things like that. Now, why would that be? Well, because neoliberal economic theory and in particular sort of efficient market trickle down theory as it is practiced in the corner C-suite of America would say that uh, a CFO should look at the balance sheet and move cost off of the balance sheet, treat labor like a cost, not an asset, move production to where it's cheapest, concentrate things because economies of scale equal cheap, uh, at least for the company. And that's what you've gotten in uh, American food supply. And that's one of the reasons the Biden administration is now putting a major antitrust emphasis on areas like poultry production, meat packing, which, you know, again, post pandemic, we saw the scrim raised. And it's like you're going back to the era of Upton Sinclair in the jungle and you're just seeing these horrendous working conditions, um, you know, and, and, and people really being looked at like widgets and, and just, um, you know, worked to the bone in terrible conditions. And so, I started looking at, all right, what are the things that led us here? And so certainly one of the things is the way in which C-suiters are encouraged. And this is how Business 101 is still taught. Finance 101 at Harvard Business School would tell you to do exactly what Tyson Chicken did or, you know, or what Smithfields does. Treat labor like a cost, go cheap, 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 go down market, outsource. But that creates risks. It creates risks in the supply chain. This efficiency theory only works if everything is moving properly. And this is something I think we really need to get our brains around as a society. We lived for the last several decades in this kind of weird, I don't wanna call it a Goldilocks period because as we've been talking about, it wasn't so great for a lot of people, but it was a period in which everything was moving in one direction. There wasn't a lot of disruption to the system. You know, there was um, a kind of a coming together economically into one, one system, the neoliberal system. There was less conflict. Uh, and so you didn't start to see the kind of pandemics and wars and um, natural disasters that you have in recent years as we've begun to see, gosh, the system is being disrupted. Okay, so that's point number one. To go back to the question of food, I then began looking at what we have incentivized in this country. And we have, as is the case with education or healthcare, our system is old and broken. It's basically uh, works on a model that comes out of the 1920s and 30s when the US was in a, um, a period where we needed to subsidize um, rural farmers to produce more calories for urban workers during an economic downturn. And so we, we subsidized these cash crops. We produced a ton of calories. 
But at this stage, we're producing four times as many calories as we need as a society, which I think we can see in the obesity crisis in this country, which then, of course, has another negative externality. Our healthcare system, the most expensive and one of the worst, frankly, and least efficient in the in the world. Um, so you get this system that is just totally lopsided and not purpose built for what we need now, which is more production of fruits and vegetables. So let's go back to the Central Valley. Great growing conditions, great um, ability to produce a lot of fruits and vegetables, but very highly concentrated, very highly siloed. And so not only do you get risk from a, just think about that from a national security perspective. If you wanted to shut down the US food system, I mean, you could just take out a couple of growing areas in the Central Valley and, and you'd be done. So, and, and you can see the siloing in the fact that many of the workers, the agricultural workers in these areas that live say 15 miles from a great growing area can't get fresh produce in their own neighborhoods. So it's just a bizarre sort of confluence. Now in the book, I tried to look at what can we do to, to offset this? And there's no one silver bullet, but there are multiple ways to start turning the needle. Um, community supported agriculture is one way. And this used to be something, the kind of farmer's market paradigm, it used to be something that was considered a little bit precious, you know, and it still is in some places, you know, you go on the weekend, you, I'm sure you're living in the Berkshires, you know, you buy your $20 cheese or whatever, or maybe you don't. And, uh, you know, that, that's not something that is sustainable for large quantities. But as we get support for that, as the local uh, state and national governments start to put a little bit more of a floor under that kind of production, costs can come down and things can be done more locally. At the same time, you've got uh, technological tailwinds that are coming in. So one of the things that is getting a lot of venture capital funding right now is precision agriculture and in particular vertical farming. And vertical farming, again, not a single silver bullet, but just an interesting example of how you can move to a highly decentralized model. Vertical farming is the ability to use um, very precise kinds of light uh, and, and water and heat to grow things literally off the sides of walls and buildings. And, you know, I've been to large campuses. The Google campus produces all the produce for thousands of workers this way on site. Um, China is looking at this kind of technology. Um, many Arab nations, places where the climate change is a big problem, they're looking at this as a way to produce food locally. And there are lots of those kinds of technologies in play. Um, so that's the agricultural piece. And then let me talk just briefly because you asked about the housing piece. Um, housing is another one of those markets that is just so distorted right now. And I think, um, you know, you mentioned private equity knocking on doors. One of the really underexplored stories, regulatory stories, I think still is the way in which Post 2008, you know, you get huge amounts of foreclosures. The subprime crisis really hit homeowners um, in in a lot of places like California, like like Arizona, many many neighborhoods that have been sort of pumped up in a kind of a financialized way. A lot of easy credit, a lot of predatory lending, prices collapse. Then you get the Blackstones of the world, the big private equity firms who are not bound by any kind of um, equitable housing rules the way, say, even a J.P. Morgan would be. If J.P. Morgan comes in and tries to buy cheap properties on the courthouse steps from people that are going bankrupt, it actually has to create a certain amount of low income housing. Blackstone, the shadow banking sector, the private equity sector, isn't even bound by those rules. So you get some of the players that actually caused 2008 coming in and profiting wildly. And so Blackstone used to have a division called Invitation Homes, which it's now spun off. At one point, they were the largest single family landlord in America. Okay, so Think about that. A remote global private equity firm is the largest single family landlord in America. Now, they got out of the housing business. They rode that boom and bust. They then got, and many other private equity players as well, got into rental properties, trailer parks. I mean, I have tracked trailer parks, um, manufactured housing projects that have literally been bought up by private equity firms. It's almost like you know, going back to it's a wonderful life and it's the the Pottersville sort of you know scenario in which you you just see these people who are the most vulnerable people in society 
being run out of their trailer parks by some of the richest people in the world. Now, those private equity firms are now moving into hospice. They're moving into utilities. They're moving into some of the in small private industrial, well-run industrial firms like those textile companies that I mentioned. And they're buying these uh, companies up. They're flipping them. They're stripping them of assets. And honestly, it is a crime. And I think that... Um, you know, we should we should have some real regulation in this country to get private equity out of strategically important um, services and things like housing, which are, you know, these aren't just assets. They're what we need to live. And I think part of what, you know, I'm realizing as you articulate some of the power dynamics here is how, you know, what's been the reception to your book from from that old power guard, from people where this this system has actually been enormously beneficial um, and and you're sort of looking at deprogramming econ you know, economists and C-suite executives. Um, is this frightening to them? You know, what's the pushback that you've been receiving? Are people receptive because maybe they understand now in a new way since the pandemic, the sort of risk profile they're dealing with? Or, yeah. you know, are you finding these kind of un unlikely allies in some of these power corridors? Mm. Yeah, it's well, you know, unlikely bedfellows are, are always, I, I find that that's always the case when I publish a book that I think it's going to appeal to X group and it ends up appealing to Y group. So just with my first book, a good example of this, this was a book, uh, the first book, Makers and Takers, basically said, you know, not just individuals are being exploited by Wall Street, business is being exploited by Wall Street. So <clears throat> the pressures of the financial markets are forcing public companies to make terrible short-term decisions that are actually going to come back to bite them in three years or five years, not to mention being bad for society. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to publish this book and all these CEOs are going to tell me how great I am. No, the CEOs are quite happy with the system because they get at this point, 30 to 80% of their compensation in stock. They love buybacks. They love Wall Street jacking the share price up. The people that were actually interested in that book were the highest level hedge funders and global traders because they were the people they're like the great white sharks in the ocean of capitalism and they smell blood you know thousands of miles away which is the change in the neoliberal paradigm and they're swimming over to see what's going on and so they were very very interested and these are the people actually fascinatingly that are making bets on a post dollar world they're they're thinking about which countries will be able to curb their elites best and thus have a more stable political system and thus be a better investing spot for me? So that's how those folks think. Now, in terms of this current book, you raised um, the issue of, of, of me being a journalist. This is actually an important point because what I'm finding, and I, I used to be, uh, when I was younger, I, I was more worried about standing up to economists and Nobel laureates and powerful people, um, I've begun to realize that sometimes those credentials are actually um, something that to hide behind. And that the simple questions, the, the questions that can be asked um, via inductive reasoning of the kind that real people use and that journalists use as we go out in the world and we say, hey, here's what the theory says, but what's actually happening in the real world is does the theory and, and felt experience match? Those are the questions that need to be asked right now. And, and I've actually gotten, to the extent that I've gotten pushback, um, it's been oftentimes from academics that are protecting their own territory and their own turf. Um, and I, I had a very, I, I won't say who, because we were all at a, at a dinner, but I had a very high level regulator recently at a dinner in Washington tell me, hey, keep doing what you're doing. We need journalists, we need more narrative. That's where we're looking to find the problems that we should be fighting and the companies we should be taking on because we understand that the models that the academics are presenting are not working. Incredible, well, thank you so much. I think that's all we've got time for today. Uh, I just wanna thank you um, for sharing some of these big picture economic ideas with us. And thank you so much to our audience for tuning in. You can find Raina's book in online and brick and mortar bookshops everywhere if you'd like to read more. And if you'd like to support the RSA's work, then please do consider joining our incredible global fellowship. That's a wrap. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for writing this book, Homecoming. It was just a fabulous week for me being able to read it, digest it, and just feels like it really hit a nerve for this moment. So thank you for, for
for writing it and uh, really hope that you you actually reach those people that can can make those decisions around the economy for us. Thank you so much, Alexa, and thanks to the RSA and everyone for listening.